Hello, check. Oh, good. Just checking the sound. So, good morning, everybody here. Um, we're kind of quite uh, quite spread out. If you've got some mates in other sessions, can you text them and tell them to come along and join us? Because uh, we we'd like a few more friends in this room. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so uh, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who is joining us online out there in the world from wherever you're connecting. You're most welcome to the final session of our seminar on valuing groundwater. We've already covered the, our ear to the ground on communities and then we had a session just earlier this morning on innovations. And now we're going to kind of bring all of that together. We present evidence from communities, science and innovation. This is a hybrid session with active participation from online contributors as well as from here on site in Stockholm. And thank you to our wonderful Odai who is managing the online part of this through the Pathable platform. Folks, we are lucky to have such a talented family of speakers here today, most of whom are in Stockholm with one of our number joining us remotely. After a keynote from Professor Rob Hope, we will have four insightful lightning talks from speakers providing a showcase of initiatives from all around the world. After that, we will go into a panel discussion with our speakers, ably moderated by Odai for our online participants and by Rob for the on-site participants. We will then have an end note presentation from our virtual presenter in Delhi, Aditi Mukherjee, before wrapping up our seminar for the year. Sorry, I think she's, she was actually not in Delhi, she's in, uh, in Bengal. <laughs> so that's quite enough for me for the moment. Over to Rob Hope, Professor of Water Policy at the University of Oxford, who will kick off the session with valuing groundwater of games, guesses and gambles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> okay. Uh -huh. Right. I Sorry. Oops. We're just going to make a start. Um, Suchi's going to help me out briefly here. Um, very nice to see everybody this morning, um, and thank you for joining us online as well. I'm just going to say a couple of reflections just to introduce our speakers who are the main act and have got some amazing material to present to us. Um, I frame this in a hopefully pr provocative and interesting way because I think there's a whole set of questions around groundwater that, you know, I can see some distinguished people in the audience who've been working on these things for many decades um, that we still that we still face in terms of um, trying to address um, um, a whole host of issues. The first slide, which you can't see before you, but will pop up in a second, is around the UNESCO book on groundwater to mark this year of groundwater globally. And it sort of reflects upon the critical importance of groundwater that supply, that's 99% or so of fresh water supplies around the world. It provides a remarkable compendium of some of the latest thinking in terms of the status, um, challenges and opportunities for how we think about groundwater in the future. So Jenny, Dr. Jenny Gromwald and various other people have contributed that to that book and I think it sets a nice platform to frame some of the, the issues and the challenges that we need to look at moving forward. Um, I would, um, here we go, um, I would um, also, if we scroll, um, if you go up, can it go on full screen? All right. Okay, sorry about the technical side of things. Um, I can scroll if that's easier. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Apologies. Um, so what I will t talk to is some of the issues around um, sort of guesses, gambles, um, within and games within groundwater systems, which which pose the challenges which our speakers will talk to. Um, 
a key thing is we all recognize is the information, the information deficit, uncertainty that we have that limits what we can say and how we can manage these systems going forward. One of the reflections I have from some of the work that I was involved in the UpGrow program, which was the unlocking the potential of groundwater for the poor, which was a large um, UK FCDO program in Africa from 2014 to 2020, was this context of coastal Kenya that you can see before you. So this is just south of Mombasa. And we were looking here um, at major growth in terms of um, industrial commercial use of groundwater from mining and also irrigated sugarcane. So you had this very quiet um, place within Kenya that hadn't really had much groundwater engagement for many years and people had real difficulties understanding the groundwater context. Through work led by Professor Daniel Alago from the University of Nairobi, we, we led a systems analysis from this and the outcome were that there were these two paleo channels, these two ancient riverbeds which had significant levels of groundwater resources that the two companies and the government simply were unaware of. And now that's led to um, new thinking in terms of the water resource management structure in this region. But up until that point, the government were granting licenses, giving permits for extraction of groundwater without any understanding of the implications of what that could be. Was there sufficient water there for these commercial uses? Would this have long-term sustainability challenges, etc.? cetera? Um, so it's one of the things that I think we all sort of recognize that this, um, the information is key to this, but it's also getting the, the information at the right scale. Individual interests sometimes don't um, play out effectively. The other aspect is around then institutions and the, you know, the capacity to manage these systems. My work has, has largely been in Africa and Asia, and I would sort of say most governments understand these issues, but often lack the ability to execute or have the political authority or the regulatory capacity to you know, generate insights from that. There can be elite capture, groundwater can be um, extraordinarily um, important in many areas, and this becomes complex in terms of how, how you would look at that. Um, I can see Dr. Sefu Kavedi in the audience who's done a lot of this work in you know, many parts of Africa as well, and you can sort of see cities under extreme pressure and uh, you know, the, the, the loss of groundwater systems, the over-abstractions in many, in many parts of, of, the, um, of the continent. And the institutional aspect of this is, is critical in terms of how we, how we move forward and improve the systems. The final, the final component that I would you know, draw attention to is the inequalities within the system. The UNESCO book gives us a very clear message in terms of the existing inequalities and the disproportionate importance of groundwater for, very, for many vulnerable communities. And we know at the moment, you know, certainly within the Horn of Africa and the very severe drought conditions in the order of 20 million people under extreme pressure, groundwater is one of the few reliable available water supplies that you know these communities these people can use both for productive and domestic uses um, and it's one of the issues that do we have enough support in terms of understanding these dynamics and what you see um, what you don't see because it's a pdf not a powerpoint is that the soci socioeconomic variation the welfare map you, you see in front of you developed by dr jacob katuva in the same part of kenya i mentioned it shows the transition from year to year in terms of welfare indices for these areas. It's not static. People move in and out of different welfare contexts. But groundwater is important, but not uniquely important for these positions. And I would reflect on, you know, groundwater is important, but not uniquely so in terms of how we improve the welfare um, for um, these communities and people. So um, I'm going to conclude at this point with you know, just some summary reflections before our key speakers come up and um, give us more insights into this. Um, the obvious things that we should be thinking about is, is reducing guesswork, that the information systems and how they can be generated. There is interesting work with Earth observation remote sensing systems, but there are validation questions around that. So, People like uh, Professor Richard Taylor's done some very interesting work sort of showing the uncertainties with 
some of these information systems. We need them, but we need these to be grounded in key strategic areas um, to ensure the, the management, the protection, the sustainable use of these systems works. And within this, we need the institutions, the strengthening institutions in terms of how they regulate and understand and having accountability mechanisms in place. Um, there's a lot of work to be done on that. I think it's, it, it, it's a huge opportunity and gap at the moment that needs um, more work. And then part of my work, a lot of people's work is sort of reloading the dice, you know, putting the most vulnerable, thinking about their situation and how we can help and support um, them achieve these goals. So I'm going to pause there. Um, thank you for your attention. And I think we will then pass over to the main speakers. I, I will pass over to the next. Perfect. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. <laughs> thank you so much, Rob, for this thought-provoking start to our session. I like the way how you moved from games, guesses and gambles to information, institutions and inequality. I think we're moving through the alphabet, not sure where, uh, where we get to the, the sweet spot of the solution. Um, so I will now, now invite uh, Professor Yan Zheng, uh, Chair of the School of Environmental Science and Engineering at the Southern University of Science and Technology, SOSTEC in China, to tell us about valuing groundwater through managing aquifer recharge. Go ahead, Jan, as soon as we're ready. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Yes, if my slides come up. You might need a little. Here we are. OK, let me see if I can advance it. It's OK, it's wonderful. OK, good morning. Um, on behalf of my co-authors, I'm really excited to share with you why smart replenishment of unseen resource groundwater using a collection of techniques known as managed aquifer recharge or MAR what allows the huma humanity to value groundwater as it meant to be. So um, I open by highlighting these take home messages. Uh, in our book published by UNESCO and available for free download um, we concluded that uh, through cost benefit and sustainability analysis of 28 diverse MAR cases in 17 countries in operations over many years. And this, we believe, has provided irrefutable evidence that MAR produces a wealth of benefits from integrated management of a wide range of conventional and unconventional water resources and very important for sustainability goal. So um, a little bit of background. Um, ever since humans have repurposed land for our use, groundwater recharge, which was previously natural, has not been natural for a very long time. So even in rural settings uh, like this one, you can see the reservoirs, uh, the orchards, uh, the other farmlands, and these are all modified landscapes. So this is actually incidental recharge. It's not natural recharge. However, this is not managed aquifer recharge. Managed aquifer recharge refers to infrastructure built like this one, as simple as a recharge basin, that allows us to purposefully recharge water to replenish, to improve, to ensure flow. So um, we, uh, this, this basically, the problem with this groundwater balance is that not only we change this recharge pattern, we also change discharge by drilling wells and pumping water out. Okay, and this has caused a lot of problems of groundwater depletion around the world and essentially we are using our children and groundwater's children without an even an IOU note. And that's reality, as we heard a lot this morning. So to illustrate MAR, what MAR can do, I'm sharing two examples from the UNESCO book. This is the location of the 28 cases that are included in this book. I highly recommend you download it. Um, and they are mostly located in regions where 
precipitation is low, so where it, there is real water scarcity, as you wish. Um, but seasonal water scarcity is also very important, such as site in coastal Bangladesh, where it only rains in three months of the year. So when I was with UNICEF, with Dhaka University and a Kacha water hydrogeologist, we initiated a MicroMar project in 2010 uh, with 20 demonstration sites. So pond water was abundant in rainy seasons and is filtered through sand, uh, through these recharge wells that we built, and then they displaced the previously brackish water and stored fresh water for use during the dry seasons. This become very, very, very critical drinking water supply. And of course, we have to deal with risks like clogging, and because we also found arsenic uh, in some of the wells, but uh, this is very much available. And another case that was very important was in Zhaodong Peninsula, another um, coastal area where there had been seawater intrusion. So Professor Wei Ping Wang standing in the middle of this, they built underground water dam to intercept the seawater and therefore to allow the base flow to be restored, but more importantly provided irrigated, irrigation water uh, until today. And there are many of these sites. So this brings me to the cost effectiveness. Uh, Andrew Ross wrote a chapter, he's an economist. Uh, what I like to highlight is that these MAR schemes we found, they are actually less than half the cost of the common alter engineering alternatives. Uh, but also I would I also point out, it's very important means to recycle water, but unfortunately that is the most expensive. So finally, I would like to uh, bring you to that MAR is a sustainable na nature-based technology. Uh, in this book, I wrote a chapter which developed nine sustainable indicators specifically for MAR, which we want to look into water balance, we want to look at water quality, and we also can show that environmental flow is um, maintained. And most importantly, in four cases, water banking for drought is demonstrated. So I would like to conclude um, by with the paper that it's about to come out in Hydrogeology Journal, uh, in which we argue to move forward, particularly in the European Union, a risk-based regular approach for the governance of MAR to allow water to be recycled and reused close water cycle is very much needed. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jan, for presenting such a convincing case on the value of managed aquifer recharge schemes. And I'm sure the econo economists in the room will have been pleased to see those numbers. Um, I will now invite Marie Lostis, a water resource specialist from Asian Development Bank, who will tell us about innovative groundwater irrigation management in the pool. So, um, do we need to kind of rhubarb rhubarb for a bit? It's <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Lucy. So still five minutes? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let me, give, I will give you a, a quick overview of an innovative project that the government of Nepal is, uh, is preparing with the support of ADB. So before we start, just a bit of, of context. Um, Nepal is largely dependent on agriculture. About 26% of the GDP uh, is for this sector and 55% of the working age population is, is engaged in the sector. So for ADB, it's a really uh, important sector for poverty reduction. Uh, most of the irrigation sector in, in uh, irrigation system, sorry, in Nepal are located in the, in the Terai area. Uh, this is a flat plain in the south of the country. But this irrigation system mainly provides supplementary uh, irrigation for, for uh, rice cultivation during the, the monsoon season and not during the dry season. So the productivity is still, is still low. And a lot of government uh, policies uh, promote actually access to year-round uh, irrigation. So this project will be developing groundwater in uh, Madesh province uh, in the south of Kathmandu in two districts. 
uh, it will be replacing um, the existing uh, not sustainable shallow tube wells with their diesel pump by a very efficient system, 500 deep tube wells with electric pump, uh, distribution, efficient distribution network, and uh, also low voltage, uh, distri low voltage distribution network. So there, there were some several critical conditions that the government needs to address uh, during when we were designing the project. The first one is to, to, to confirm that the groundwater abstraction will be sustainable. So we have done a, a groundwater modeling that uh, under the so different climate change scenarios and it confirmed that uh, the abstraction will be, will be sustainable. The groundwater is plenty available in the, in the foothills of the, of the Himalaya. Then we need to put in place a, a proper financing mechanism, uh, especially for the operation and maintenance of the system. I will, I will spoke about, speak about it in the next slide. And then we also did a, a farmer's willingness to pay survey, uh, to first to understand the context uh, in the project area and also to verify that the farmer are willing and able to pay for a service uh, irrigation service fee. Of course, it should be affordable to, to all. Um, also, we we didn't want to stop at the water component, so we need to add also uh, support to the farmers to to improve their farming practices, agricultural practices, so they they can increase the crop the crop water productivity and generate more incomes. So, um, and the last point is to confirm that we have uh, affordable and reliable energy supply. In Nepal, it's mainly uh, hydropower. Uh, let me now give you an, an overview of some innovation we are bringing in this project. Uh, it will be the first design, build, operate, DBO uh, contract modality in the irrigation sector in Nepal. We are targeting four years for design, build, and 10 years for operation and maintenance. We, the government is also establishing now an independent irrigation management company who will uh, manage the asset uh, on behalf of the government. They will collect the fees, put in the next row account, and they will pay the DBO contractor. In terms of design, we are also um, designing a state-of-the-art uh, pressurized system with VSD, variable speed drive pump. So the farmers will be able to use micro-irrigation or, or sprinkler if they want. And the DBO contractor will also be tasked with uh, controlling the, the energy and water consumption, but also the groundwater level and the water quality under his contract. And finally, it's about the farmer support program. So we will be introducing uh, climate resilient varieties, uh, extension services, and uh, efficiency in marketing. Uh, let me, my last slide, quickly just show you uh, some picture of a, of a pilot uh, we are doing now. Uh, finance with uh, it's supported by the Netherlands Trans Fund. So on the top you can see the pump house, the tube wells, then you can see the oh I forgot about the prepaid meter system. So the farmer one key component, sorry, it's about the prepaid meter system that the farmers will use. So every farmer will have a smart card and thanks to the card they will they will be able to activate the pump. So it's a, an upfront payment and uh, in it's also for financial sustainability. It's one of the key key component of the of the system, and you can see also the buried pipe and the and the outlet. So we have done this pilot to to showcase the concept, to explain to the farmer how to use uh, the prepaid meter system, and um, also to it will serve as a demonstration scheme for the farmers, for the government, for the potential bidders. Uh, once we will uh, we will advertise. Let me just conclude with some uh, smile from our uh, women farmers in, uh, in the project area. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> On time? Very good. <laughs> yes, very impressive. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Marie, for providing us with such an encouraging. Uh, sorry, <laughs> well, my, 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 stop it. Um, so su such an encouraging vision of an environmentally and financially and socially sustainable model uh, of groundwater extraction in Nepal. Um, now we're going to hear from Tom Eisman from the Nature Conservancy, who will share his experience of valuing groundwater-dependent ecosystems in food-producing landscapes. Go for, you, go for it, Tom. <laughs> so oh, there's one here. Okay, great, well thanks. Um, it's nice to be here, it's great to be here. Uh, as introduced, I'm Tom Meisman, I'm with the Nature Conservancy, which is a global conservation organization. 
I'm based in the United States, but we work in uh, over 70 countries around the world, uh, and our mission is around protecting nature uh, and for the benefits of people. And here I want to talk about the opportunity to value groundwater dependent ecosystems. We've heard about the multiple values of groundwater, and, and certainly part of it is in agriculture and food producing landscapes. So I want to look a little bit at the intersections of food production. At food production, okay, I'm getting a thumbs up here now, the microphone is working. Um, some of the intersections around food production and groundwater dependent ecosystems and some of the opportunities that provides to help support these ecosystems. And so I'm actually going to start with the food systems side. This is a report that the Nature Conservancy did, a global assessment of food system types and identifying different kinds of foodscapes, which is the intersection in this uh, assessment of the food production that's happening, as well as kind of the landscape and ecosystem factors that surround it and support food production. And so this is looking at the different types of food producing systems uh, or foodscapes globally. And what we looked at was the potential for nature-based solutions to help promote um, conservation or environmental benefits through working with agricultural production. But then I want to turn to a similar global scale assessment of groundwater dependent ecosystems. And this actually has been presented in a different session this week. It's an assessment led by the Nature Conservancy um, doing a global analysis. This actually focuses more on the arid or dry land regions for reasons of remote sensing and the, and the signals that are, that are able to, to be detected. Um, but what it shows is some of the places in green with a likely groundwater dependent ecosystem, some in yellow, which are not likely but need, need to be some ground truthing, and some of which these places haven't been analyzed. But the point here being that, that we know globally a lot about the food production types uh, the potential for nature-based solutions and where it intersects with these groundwater dependent ecosystems. And so what are some of the things that we can do about that? And one of the things that the Nature Conservancy wants to promote is the use of nature-based solutions for groundwater. And this is another piece that's going to be presented actually later today in a session by Isabel Jorgensen. Um, and it's a survey of nature-based solutions for agricultural groundwater management. And I will say that um, I'm just showing a, a brief snapshot here, of course, but what she has done is looked at um, three kinds of nature-based solutions in groundwater. One is the indigenous, ancestral, or traditional practices. One is about green-gray nature-based solutions and the opportunity to to integrate with some of the some of the traditional infrastructure, including, as was mentioned earlier, even with managed aquifer recharge, there are opportunities to to really promote um, natural components to that, as well as the institutional NBS, or how do you set up systems that can help to manage and support these ecosystems? And so this is an example of of one you would have a a, a type of nature-based solution, uh, kind of where it's been deployed and how it, um, what are some of the descriptions, pros and cons, and some of the research or citations that can support it. And so this is just one example of a long list, and it also is taking a look at these nature-based solutions and where they intersect in the, in the groundwater cycle, and what are some of the beneficiaries and outcomes that they can generate. So I recommend this report, and it's a good way to start to think about what are the potential solutions that you can use to protect these groundwater dependent ecosystems. And then as we're talking a lot about valuing groundwater, I did wanna also speak a little bit about incentives. How do we promote these practices? How do we implement some of these nature-based solutions? And this is some work um, from Charles White, who's been working with the Nature Conservancy on Oxford to do some research about the potential for, for um, incentive-based approaches to nature-based solutions, and suggesting that there are um, opportunities to look at the interface of groundwater and surface water, to look at the economics of the different uses, the values of these uses, um, and also to match certain transactions or tools to provide these solutions. And so finally, even though I started with a global mapping, I do want to say that this is important that we do these um, projects in place is the global maps can help point us in a direction, but, but this is really what the Nature Conservancy does is we work 
in places like the Gran Chaco in Argentina to help look at the actual, um, how the groundwater dependent ecosystems show up on the ground, what are the agricultural management practices and what are the opportunities to deploy nature-based solutions in this context. And so we have projects like this, as I said, around the world. And, and ultimately, that's the next step, is to start to, to use these practices in places. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. So thank you, Tom. Um, I particularly liked the, uh, the survey of MBS for, for, agri uh, for um, agricultural management that, that included indigenous, ancestral, and traditional MBS, along with the more customary green and gray and institutional MBS. So our next speaker is Shuchivora, <laughs> Program Officer, Global Resilience Partnership. And Shuchi will share how the value lies in the eye of the beholder through a systems analysis of drought policy in Maharashtra, India. Is this audible? Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, you've seen me enough over here a few times now, so sorry about that. Didn't intend that for that to happen. But anyway, uh, I shall start talking about my presentation, but before that, I'd like to wish you a very happy Ganesh Chaturthi. In India, in parts of India, especially in Maharashtra and Gujarat, where I come from, uh, we celebrate, can you hear me better? Yeah. We celebrate the birth of the elephant god today. And this is super significant in the context of values, um, groundwater and nature and communities because there's a high spiritual significance of the, the elephant god in the context of balance and reciprocity with human and non-human life. So with that, uh, I'll start my conversation around Maharashtra and I'll, I'll get on to the boring stuff first and get into the interesting stuff later. Um, to start out, start out with, uh, no prizes for guessing, groundwater is super important in, in Maharashtra, uh, contributes to the economy, contributes to people's uh, water needs, but again with, uh, with uh, four months of rainfall, 85% of, of India is dependent, of the population is dependent directly or indirectly on groundwater. Um, and Marathwada, or Maharashtra, where, uh, which is a part of Maharashtra where uh, my work was largely focused pre-COVID, uh, is highly uh, water stressed. It has, uh, it has been chronically water stressed, but it has suffered a drought since uh, early 2000s. And, um, Climate change has been largely a contributor with uncertain um, rainfall patterns, but a large contributor to this to this uh, manifestation of drought impacts has been the way water has been used. Now, the government has not been unaware of this. They're, they're aware of it, and they're, they're, they have been working towards managing water. They've been investing in largely supply-side solutions. Uh, these are also nature-based solutions, most of them. There's been a large investment since the 1980s, uh, up to about 750 uh, million US dollars, uh, cumulatively since uh, since the 1980s on different projects, which include nature-based solutions, uh, kind of to, and and they're they're sort of falling within that paradigm of uh, institutional green gray and traditional management practices. So largely within that paradigm. However, uh, groundwater remains an externality in that conversation because demand is not not managed and uh, solutions are not cited in a way that groundwater uh, is looked at uh, within that paradigm of the hydrogeological cycle. So we entered this context knowing that there are there is a lot already happening, that a lot of NGOs, a lot of government organizations, a lot of uh, academics are already working on managing ground, managing groundwater and surface water through these watershed interventions. It's, it's a common practice. And we realize that it's not working. So there has to be a shift in the way we value groundwater in this state particularly to shift the conversation from what's not working to what might work or what will work. And for that, we required some amount of consensus building within these groups of different disciplinary biases, different uh, worldviews probably, and different uh, lenses with which they came onto the ground. So we were working in a small river basin in Maharashtra, in Nashik, uh, called the, uh, called, it was, it's called the Devnadi River. And we worked with hydrologists from a premier university in India, IIT Bombay. Many of you might have heard of it. Um, with local agriculture experts, practitioners, uh, community members, uh, 
policy makers at at the grassroots level so village institutional institution heads and uh, ecologists and hydrogeologists and some of the things that we did was to build out a map of what how groundwater is important and how groundwater is linked to the various aspects around livelihoods agriculture um, ecology um, water use and um, land management so all of this i don't want to get into details of this map the idea to show this is that the communities uh, and the experts in that room understood and built this map so there was a large amount of consensus building conflict and uh, exchange of ideas in in kind of bringing all of this together um, and with that i leave you with three key messages uh, one policy historically has undervalued groundwater mainly the surface water groundwater linkages it's not really groundwater that's been undervalued but the link between surface water and groundwater and uh, storage has been the large large focus of how uh, water has been managed overall um, the community may not understand the hydrogeology or the science of groundwater and which is what probably um, which has been currently the focus of india's uh, policy shifts there has been a focus in uh, through the world bank on uh, a huge groundwater scheme across the country where uh, where knowledge or hydrogeology is being is being translated and and uh, transmitted to communities so that they can manage their water better but there is immense value to local uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems there's immense value to uh, phreatophytes like fig trees which uh, have deep roots into the groundwater uh, into hard rock aquifers and these are spiritually significant springs are highly spiritually significant in this area and um, and these become rally points and that last point of synergies these become those points of synergies these have become points of conversations which the policy maker gets it and which um the probably the hydrologist and the hydrogeologist geologist in the room also get and the community member is very passionate about so starting from that point of from from that point of synergies rather than trade offs has been probably been game changing in this process uh, with that i'd just like to thank our partners and thank you Thank you, Shruti. I love it that you included groundwater dependent ecosystems in your plural values uh, discussion. They're so important for the well-being of us and the planet and a great way to measure the health of our groundwater. And I'm sure the elephant god must be a GDE. <laughs> so now uh, we're going to move to our panel discussion. So I invite the speakers to come up here on stage. Um, and the panel discussion will be moderated here by Rob and online by Odai. Um, so I'll just hand over to you. I just think I'll just move down. Thanks. Come up. Come up. Oh, is this? So while our panelists are taking um, a seat, what we wanted to do here, we've got about <coughs> um, 20 minutes or so for this this section of um, our discussion this morning. Um, we wanted to sort of explore a little bit more s one of the points that Shuchi brought in about multiple values and also to play back on the idea of making groundwater visible. It's sort of become a little bit of a mantra in the reports that we see. It's not necessarily new. This has been said by many people before. And there is this sort of question, the so what question. So if groundwater is visible, will that change anything? Will that lead to better outcomes for the environment, for society, etc.? Is that sufficient? And the question that I'd like to pose to the panelists is for them to reflect on this idea of um, multiple values, what Suchi's sort of introduced and they've touched upon individually in their presentations, you know, what would those multiple values be from their work and experience and to what extent that starts to change how you're, how you're thinking about these things? So, um, I mean, maybe if we go in order of the presentations, if, if Jan, you would like to um, provide us a couple of reflections to start. Um, gee, okay. So <laughs> the multiple values of groundwater. So uh, I'm so convinced of it, now I work on replenishing it. Um, so um, I think it's been said, uh, I think it's incredibly important 
uh, is the drinking water supply for the poor. So, um, but there we have a lot of groundwater quality problem. Um, I work a lot on arsenic in groundwater, but there's also uh, the threat from the sewage. Um, it's also incredibly important to ensure food security. Um, and this is what really concerns me in the earlier of the laureate uh, session. The point has been made by the three laureates in the previous three years that we lose, we have a net loss through agriculture, through evapotranspiration to take water, mine groundwater from underground and then send it somewhere else in the earth system. So this water cycle is broken. Um, and then, of course, people's made a lot of connection about the environmental flow, so which we see in, in, in our state. And there's a conflict, for example, in the Mahajastra, when you do the check dam, and then you retain water up gradient for agriculture, but then down, down gradient ecosystem. So um, I think the, just to be hopeful, um, I think the only thing that I can think about is we need to come up with the governance system and investment and community engagement that we need to learn to recycle water a lot more mm -hmm. in all means and see groundwater aquifer as part of this uh, exchange. It's dynamic, it doesn't just sit there. Of course, when we do this, we have to worry about protecting it at the same time. So that's basically, um, I'm fully convinced of multiple value groundwater and we need to move beyond from just abusing it. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, Marie, would you like to share some thoughts? Yeah, uh, I, can, uh, I can reflect on this project that I know, I know very well in Nepal. Um, I've been there like four months ago. Again, it's it's a very poor area in, in, in the in, in, in the country and a huge agricultural potential. So for me, economic and social is the two aspects that we are really focusing on it. And we believe that if we increase the incomes of the farmers, the whole area will be transformed, that mm. they will have access to school, education, better nutrition. Uh, they we may, might stop the out migration of the people. So mm. it, it will impact the whole society there locally. So. Um, it's, yeah, it will, uh, in terms of values, I guess it goes beyond the, the water itself. Yeah, thank brilliant, you. thank <laughs> you. Um, Tom, would you like to? Yeah, I, I forgot, we were going in order here, but I was actually, I came before <laughs> Xu Chen was speaking. So, uh, you know, I realized, Rob, that, that when I showed that map of groundwater dependent ecosystems, that is an attempt to make that value uh, visible, right? Mm -hmm. that, that by mapping these ecosystems, we can show where they occur on the landscape and try to articulate the connection. I think the thing though that that a map doesn't tell or even that that even being in that landscape and, and seeing seeing those ecosystems, it doesn't tell you necessarily what's the source of that, what's needed to sustain it, or what are the trends that are happening in the underlying aquifer that's supporting it. Mm -hmm. And so I think we still have more work to do to convey that or communicate that, the connection between these ecosystems that people may value in their communities, mm. uh, but not understanding some of the trends that may be jeopardizing them. And then ultimately, what are some of the strategies that they can use to, to protect them? And that's what we'll need, I think, is to make that, that trend and the value visible mm. um, so they can take action to protect them. Yeah, that's fantastic. And so before Suchi starts, um, we will open this up to questions after her. So if you've got some questions, please think about them. And we'll also, um, Udai and I will bring in some of the remote questions as well. Suchi, over to you. So I, I mean, I'm going to steal some uh, conversations that happened in earlier sessions. Um, Andrea Erickson Kuros from TNC uh, made very interesting points around the session on valuation and valuing of water and, and that was largely fresh water but groundwater was a major concern in the room uh, as was exhibited at that point and she said what is socially acceptable is probably the key to to the idea of valuing so yes there could be a, a monetary value or a number put to it but at the same time sometimes that could work with the stakeholder or sometimes it couldn't. So there's there's always that question of what is socially acceptable that, that needs to be um, 
that needs to be catered to and, and consensus building, I guess, is the point to start when, when we're doing that. Mm. Fascinating. So, I mean, there's probably lots of questions on that in terms of socially acceptable. Who do you include and how are those social decisions made? Great. Well, th thanks. Th I mean, that's provided a good sort of introductory landscape. So, I mean, I'm very interested if you've got any questions on the presentations, on values, if we could have um, a show of hands or we can bring in <coughs> some um, um, remote questions as well. So, we've got two here. So if you can keep your questions fairly short, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, I have a ton of questions. They were all <laughs> just as what I said. Awesome that. <laughs> um, however, I think I'll just start with one very specific one for the for the professor who spoke about managed aquifer recharge. Um, what is the institutional environment in which you see managed aquifer recharge being most successful? Is this um, like what scale are you talking about? I guess because. Farmers can, as a communities um, within the norms of, of villages in, in, in the rural developing world, work together to build recharge wells. I mean, it's something that has happened, a lot of evidence about it. At the same time, uh, it seems like there may also be a role for external agents like the government, um, uh, and different local planning authorities. Uh, where do you see managed aquifer recharge being most successful, and, and what, at what scale do you see it? Um, at, at, what, how do the institutional environments work at different scales, I guess? Okay, brilliant, thank you. And um, can we do introduction, could you just briefly introduce yourself as well? Sorry, I'm a PhD candidate in urban and regional planning at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston. And what's your name? Uh, Gokul Sampath. Okay, pleasure to meet you. Yeah, I'm uh, John Cherry, and I'm a hydrogeologist of many decades, um, and I've done research on many topics. Uh, and uh, what I find is that when we hydrogeologists want to do research at the interface, for example, the interface of, of, uh, of uh, ecology, wetlands, water holes, and all of that, um, it's, it's very difficult and there's hardly anything happening. So we can talk all we want about trying to get groundwater concepts into the game, but if you're, if you're operating in an area where there's almost no scientific research, then there's kind of a stumbling block. So I guess my question is, how can you, and, and we hydrogeologists can't do anything because in universities we're all siloed. When we reach out to our ecology professor colleagues, uh, I mean, it, it's a risky business to do, do research at the interface because you've got to publish fast, etc. So I guess my question is, do you have any ideas uh, how to stimulate research at the interface because it's these interfaces now that are important, whether it's ecology or human understanding or whatever? Okay, thank you. Well, there's um, two good questions. Um, are, are there any other others? I think we could take one or two more. The gentleman at the back um, and the gentleman here as well. So we'll take these two. Good morning. Uh, my name is Saadi Ali from Palestinian Water Authority. Uh, my uh, question to the Professor G uh, regarding the recharge and recovery. First, uh, is these schemes are uh, controlled uh, uh, recharge and recovery, so it is the area is specific and uh, where you are not allowing the flow outside this area or it is open. Second, I noticed the big difference between the cost of the recovered cobalt meter between the China and Bangladesh, where it is almost $5.3 dollar for the cubic meter in the first case and then something, just a few sentences for the second case. So what are the reasons behind this? Is it is a scale uh, issue or it is the aquifer, uh, the depth or whatever. Uh, my uh, question to the next presenter regarding the design built uh, contract operate. Uh, I want here to elaborate where is the farmer standing with this contract? Is it a contract directly with the farmer association or it is a government? Who is the account? Is there an institution where the farmer are involved and they will be responsible and accountable for this managing contract or it is a government will or any ministry? Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we'll take one question from the gentleman at the back. Um, and I'll say to the panelists, when you answer, can you, they'll be around after the session, so if you could just give fairly short answers and then we can bring in the remote community as well. Thank you. I'm Mikhail Brincic coming from Slovenia and I'm hydrogeologist. 
and connecting to the John Cherry's interface between sciences. Today, we know that groundwater is an ecosystem. It's no more just ecosystems which are depending on groundwater as a wetlands, but we know that aquifer is an ecosystem. Just remember the karst. There is 15% of karst aquifers around the world, and in karst we know that animals are living, and biologists are coming more and more aware that also animals are living in other aquifers. And should we talk and think about the ecological status of groundwater? That's first thing, and this is just a short question. What about emerging contaminants of mar in urban areas? Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. Um, I'll invite the panelists, if you could respond just briefly to some of those. Um, Jan, you seem to be under the spotlight, <laughs> but if you can give a short answer, I'm sure she'll stay after the presentation, but maybe just some summary responses, if you would. Uh, yes, I, I think there were sp all of the mass questions that I can respond to. I'll just go in sequence, first to the MIT uh, student. Um, go read the book, and in the institutional setting, I think I'm, we're just so pleased. Just people made things work. Okay, so they come in such a diverse institution arrangements, you can write a book about it. Um, but, but very importantly, though, in one of the uh, nine sustainability indicators, one of them is uh, addressing this aspect, aspect. This doesn't mean there isn't work to do. Uh, actually, um, sound regulatory framework uh, is very, very important. There's a professor, Sharon McDowell, who's sitting in the back. Uh, you may wish to talk to her with as well, she's a policy uh, expert uh, and rig on this in this aspect. Uh, the second question it was the stimulating research. Um, it is very difficult. Um, I used to call myself the one person interdisciplinary team, um, and it's just more challenging. I think the, the to answer that the answer to that is to train students. Universities must learn to train next generations of scientists to work at interface, and uh, and maybe you know they they will suffer a little bit, uh, but they will eventually em emerge and be successful, or at least to the humanities. Um, the third question, I think you were asking about the ownership. You know who kind of runs the coordinate. Uh, this mar and for different scales, there's also very different arrangements, and uh, the scale was from a few hundred cubic meter recharge water to tens of millions of cubic meter. That I didn't talk about on the x-axis. That was actually the volume of recharge per year. So it's great variability already working, but we currently only recharge about 1% of groundwater extracted globally. So it's a tiny fraction, it's a wedge. Personally, I think maybe we could do 10% or more. So this will change. Uh, and then to your fourth question, you are absolutely right. Aquifer is an ecosystem. I also work a lot with microbiologists. Let's remember most of the Earth's biomass are microbes. We don't know them, we don't see them. We all suffer through one, this particular COVID-19 right now. And I have my worries, so this is one of the points that I was trying to make in the Hydrogeology Journal paper that will soon to, to come out in the year of groundwater collection. So thank you. That's brilliant. Um, Marie? On this, uh, on this modality, so just uh, to 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 be clear, the, deep, the 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 asset will will the, the government will own the asset, and there will still be uh, it's not a concession or lease. Uh, it will remain with the government, and the DBO will mainly uh, operate, maintain uh, the asset on behalf of the government, and will be paid for that. And then you have the farmers and the water user associations. They will be a client. They will receive a services, and they will pay for our services. Of course, we will we will support them with improving their agriculture practices, farming practices, and connect them to the market also. But well, they will basically, there will be a, a client for this for this project. When we have done the survey, we have surveyed 1,000 households, and 97% of them reply that they were ready to accept a, a, an, um, an operator to provide on-demand irrigation, of course, if they get the reliable services. Because with, with pump, if it's broken in two, after two, three days, if the pump is still broken, 
there is no water and the farmers may lose their crops. So operation maintenance is really the key, the key aspect for groundwater projects that we are trying to address with this new modality. Thank you. <laughs> well, I would just quickly second the point about the importance of institutional or um, kind of regulatory frameworks for managing the resource and, and thinking uh, about one of the places I'm familiar with, California, being a place where obviously there's a lot of economic value to the groundwater. And as a result, I think, um, more attention to the regulation of the resource and consequently more information uh, and data available to understand the resource and the trends and more money to invest in the solutions, including managed aquifer recharge, which can have benefits for, for ecosystems as well. So I think that is an important element in thinking about some of the other questions that were discussed. And, and I support the idea of having more integrated research. I think it's something that the Nature Conservancy could do. We, we can't influence the students or um, kind of their course of study, but I think there's an opportunity to generate more interest in the field and among the resource managers. I realize not every place is California. We're not gonna have the same level of resources or research or data, but we can help to promote that. And I would just say in, in closing, at a session earlier this morning, we heard from the United States Geological Survey, which is doing a lot of work on recharge uh, in aquifers in uh, Eastern Africa. And so I think there are opportunities to see even those um, kind of international collaborations and in supporting the work when we get the right alignment. Okay, and Sushi, briefly. I'm going to be super quick and probably a little provocative, but I feel like, um, and, and I'm going to stick to the only two questions out of all the questions, but I feel like um, institutional frameworks and regulatory frame frameworks often come as an afterthought, which is a problem. Um, we need to start, before we think of what solution to apply, we need to start thinking about what process goes into action. Uh, and for that process to happen, we need multidisciplinary research. In fact, we need transdisciplinary research, which is, which is cutting across boundaries and really being fluid about the kind of complex and nested challenges we face. Okay, thank you. And Uday, do we have any questions from the online audience? Uh, yes, we do. We have a comment from Viviana Rhee. I believe we much underestimate groundwater's role in our life, often forgetting it sustains most of our activities from food production to drinking water. Hopefully we can all partner in making groundwater more visible. And a question from Aditi to Marie. How has ADB learned from previous failures of deep tube wells and underground pipelines and service provision, which farmers found too complicated and service provision too poor? Nepal did invest in deep tube wells way back in the 1980s, and their failure perhaps offer, offers important lessons. Thank you. Uh, but this is why we are actually introducing this, this modality, because historically the tube wells are managed by the communities themselves or by the government. And as you say, a lot of them are defunct. They are not maintained, they are not, uh, this is why we, involving the private sector could be one of the, one of the solutions uh, to, to, to make this, to make this work. Um, or we learn from our past, uh, past experience. <laughs> Great. I'm conscious of time. I don't know whether we've got time for any more questions from the floor or we, we do. Okay, so if there are any further questions or reflections, um, you've already had a question, but maybe we, I don't know if any of the ladies in the audience, it seems to be a lot of um, <coughs> men asking the questions at the moment. So um, are there any, any reflections out on the floor or we can get into the process of um, wrapping up. I mean, I might, if I may um, exploit my position chairing this, um, think to Professor John Cherry's question about this interdisciplinary modalities. I mean, I think it's a very important question and, you know, within the academic space, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to develop these interdisciplinary platforms, which are so important and, uh, and illuminating in terms of how you, you know, move forward policy processes more effectively. Um, my two reflections on that, I mean, I think the donor community can help. So what, 
was differed FCDO now had this large program unlocking the potential of groundwater for the poor. It was you know, reasonably well funded. It brought a lot of uh, partners together. Um, a colleague, uh, Professor Sefu Kibedi, is in, in the room, and he was part of that program as well. And I think that provides one modality to bring people together. My, my minor criticism of the program, I would like to see that sort of more led not by USGS, but sort of African partners, Asian partners, where there's a lot of capacity. I think there's still too much of the funding is controlled by North America, Europe, and it's not building you know, the great capacity that exists and the continuity in funding, which is a headache for all of us. Please, J take the microphone. Universities are the most uh, uh, backward traditional places in the world. <laughs> um, and so we professors are in our silos and we have to publish our papers. So in fact, the prospects for interacting across disciplines are gonna have to be forced from the outside. And it really, it means that funding has to come along where you say to a university, okay, can you get the ecologist together with the hydrogeologist or whatever? That's the only hope. Don't expect any progress in universities unless you push it. Okay, great. We've got two questions at the back. Um, so we've got two ladies and we've got um, Professor Cabetti as well. So we'll, if you can keep your questions short, and I will say to our panelists, keep your responses even shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yes, this is uh, Sharon McDowell, University of Arizona. And thank you for noting that no women had asked a question. I had noted that myself, but I couldn't think of a good question. I don't have a question. I have a <laughs> comment. And I'm going to disagree with my esteemed friend now, John Cherry. <laughs> um, so I'm trained as an economist, and economists are, and I don't do that anymore. I don't write in Greek letters or any of that stuff. And um, economists are very siloed. Um, I came to learn hydrologists after my training, and they fight in courts, one hand, the other hand, and stuff just like that. Um, at the University of Arizona, we're known for our multidisciplinary, multidisciplinarity. Um, I think it's there, and I think if people don't see it, it's because they're not looking for it, and they're not looking for the opportunities. Yes, tenure decisions still have their problems, but I think I'm gonna want to just make a comment of encouragement there's great opportunity, and I want to endorse the comment about thinking about institutions and governance early. That's what I try to s do and say in some of my writings, and some people have accused me of being fluff. Well, I think that's a reflection, again, of the person commenting. So I'll be a little provocative here in my comment. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And I think there's a lady behind as well. Hi, uh, I just wanted to, to add something. My name's uh, Alison Parker. I'm from Cranfield University in the UK. Um, and I, I guess I have the, a privilege that's maybe a bit different to what John Terry has been saying. I sit in a water science department. So I sit in a department which I'm the only hydrogeologist, really. Um, but I sit with uh, social scientists and chemical engineers all the time. So it is a different model of working. Uh, but then when I go back into the rest of academia, the, everyone sits in silos and I find it a bit weird. Um, but I just wanted to, it's more, again, more of a comment, so apologies rather than a question, but I, just, I've written social science packages into funding from NERC, which is a Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. I've written them into projects with EPSERC, which is engineering. You know, the funders are actually quite receptive to do it, so just everyone be brave and reach out to your colleagues and, and write those multidisciplinary programs, because I don't think they're being pushed back by the funders. I think the funders have, have got quite an appetite for them. Fantastic, thank you. And then um, finally, um, Professor Cabetti. Yep, okay, so very briefly. Um. Yeah, I'll try to be very quick. Uh, <laughs> yes, so <coughs> my question is to the, the presentation on uh, managed aquifer recharge and then the great values that it has in, in monetary terms and then if so, why don't we see you know millions of them? You know, we we have under hundred mar schemes in Africa, but the values are so enormous. But why don't we have it? You know, is it time issue? Like uh, some inventions take very long time before it is kind of taken. I, I was searching Google and then found parachute parachute was discovered some 300 years ago and then used only very recently. So 
is there any equivalence between mar and the parachute? Uh, meaning the time consideration, something that we don't know that is kind of lingering, you know. So okay, so great. So I'm just gonna get some direction how much time we've got before we close the panel. Um, one minute. We're out of time. Okay, well I will, you've got five seconds for a final reflection quickly from the panel. Let's just go, just go around quickly, please. I enjoyed the comments from the crowd. Um, thank you very much, good feedback, uh, a lot to reflect on. I think I'd echo that. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> oh, um, I'll talk to you afterwards. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for the questions. Thank you for the panelists. And I think we'll move to the next stage now. Thank you so much. and I'm sure our, our presenters will be available for you to talk to afterwards. Now we're turning to our online presenter for an end note presentation on the value of groundwater in clean energy transition. Aditi Mukherjee is a principal researcher at the International Water Management Institute in New Delhi, and she's presenting from Kolkata in West Bengal. Over to you, Aditi. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much, and I... I enjoyed the discussion so far um, and very happy to join. Um, uh, should I share my screen or how will this work? Okay, let me share my screen if that, that works. Somebody needs to put in a chat and say that uh, if they can see my screen. Is this working? Oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. I, I wasn't able to. Hi, I hope all of you can hear me. And um, good afternoon from Kolkata. And um, I am very sorry that I couldn't make it in person. But having uh, written this year's IPCC report, somehow I couldn't get myself to get on a plane for, a, for an engagement. And technology allows us now to connect remotely. So thank you for the organizers, uh, Jenny and Suchi, for, for inviting me. What I'm going to talk about, and I saw that uh, almost everything around groundwater has been covered, values across different sectors, food, um, recharge, and, um, and other all values around ecosystems. I just wanted to touch a little bit around um, what value can, how energy transitions can also happen while valuing groundwater. Um, so, uh, first of all, I had a couple of uh, key messages. First is that um, climate change is affecting groundwater, perhaps not as, um, as much as surface water for obvious reasons. But if groundwater is managed well, it is actually absolutely critical for, uh, for our climate resilient future. And one of the important ways in which we do achieve climate resilience right now is, um, or mitigate climate change is through clean energy transition. So I wanted to touch about how clean energy transition and groundwater are also linked. So these are some of our findings from the working group two chapter of the IPCC of which 
is one of the coordinating lead authors. I won't. I don't want to read this out in uh, in detail because water so all of you are already in certain places human induced uh, depletion um, and these are uh, you know in the US and Middle East in, in, in India where I am based North China plains etc and some of the interesting observed changes of linking climate change and groundwater are around linear associations between precipitation and recharge then there is also we are finding increasingly case studies from various places where diffused or focused recharge dominates so there is some relationship between um, intense rainfall events which are likely to become more which has already become more frequent actually and will become even more so at a warmer world and some relationship between that and higher recharge especially in the arid areas so we have examples of that happening happening in, in, in India, US and some of the some of the countries in Africa. There are a few studies coming up. Uh, when it comes to future uh, projections, I think we are on a much more shaky ground because um, modeling groundwater currently is also is is uh, is is quite complex as, as most of you know better than I do. Uh, but also um, uh, future projections kind of makes it uh, even more more challenging. So what we are finding is this is a synthesis of various modeling studies that suggest that uh, climate change will lead to general decrease in recharge in aquifers in semi-arid arid tropics, but then there's a large uncertainty in these models. So, so the point I wanted to make was in this context was that uh, climate change, which is human cause, which is because of our high level of emissions, unsustainable lifestyles and extremely high carbon emissions is affecting groundwater. Why should we worry? Because what this session has been all about, that groundwater is important for pretty much everything that we do. And this is, uh, this I'm citing the example of India where I'm from, but India is also the world's largest user of groundwater. Um, uh, uh, almost 25 to 30% of the global groundwater that is extracted uh, globally is, is in India. And those are used for uh, irrigation. So our food system, for instance, is completely dependent on groundwater. Uh, these are some of the numbers, 60% of India's irrigation, irrigated areas are groundwater irrigated. We have around 20, 20 million plus wells, 50% of rice, wheat are groundwater irrigated. Groundwater is important for cities, it's important for health, it's important for pretty much uh, all, all the things that uh, you can imagine and has been discussed. Um, so this is how rapidly groundwater irrigation expanded in India and I and I know of many other countries including Bangladesh which has seen similar absolutely similar graph the number on this side can be different but many of the countries in South Asia have seen rapid increase in groundwater irrigation and groundwater has been instrumental for our food security. Um, so this has led to all kind of unsustainable use again something we talk a lot about. So what do we do about it? I think most of it is around what do we do? Uh, so um, I just wanted to bring in the perspective of a nexus approach. We need to look at groundwater, not only from a, uh, from a water uh, perspective, groundwater because of its contribution to other sectors. Managing groundwater is actually beyond just managing, you know, having laws and policies around groundwater. A lot of the way we manage groundwater in the context of India, but also globally is actually indirectly. I mean, what kind of crop prices do farmers get besides what kind of irrigation they're going to use? So if you can incentivize getting better prices for low water consuming crop, that's one indirect way of influencing groundwater use. Similarly, uh, what kind of electricity or energy prices they pay vis-a-vis -vis what crops they grow also influences groundwater use. Um, so uh, one of the good ways of influencing uh, uh, managing groundwater is I am convinced that we need to take a water, electricity and food kind of a perspective for managing groundwater and various things are being done in various parts of the world. Um, uh, some of these are in the electricity sector, some are in the food sector and some limited solutions actually are in the water sector. And finally, I wanted to talk about some of the new things that we are starting to do. Coming back to the climate change argument, for climate change, IPCC reports have, have shown 
that this is actually the decade of action. In this decade, if we do not mitigate, and by that I mean reduce carbon dioxide, Side and all greenhouse gas emissions, we are on a course to hit 1.5 degrees as early as the next, like mid of 2030s. That's not very far at all. So right now, emissions need to go drastically and every sector has to decarbonize. And groundwater, one of the things about groundwater is it does take energy to pump. So in India, almost 8 to 10% of total energy um, that's used in agriculture is for, is for groundwater pumping. So how do we manage groundwater while transitioning to clean energy. So one of the things, and how can we then provide incentive to farmers to use groundwater more efficiently? So right now in India, various states have various programs to solarize groundwater pumps. We have around 250,000 solar pumps in India right now, which is still minuscule compared to the 20 million pumps that we have, but there's something has started. So one of the things we have been doing here is um, once a farmer gets solarized, he or she becomes energy producer from simple energy consumer. And that's a huge thing when you th think in terms of just energy transition. So a farmer is no longer a consumer who's consuming electricity, but also producing. And then on top of that, if you provide opportunity for farmers to decide how much of that energy is to be used for pumping and how much to send to the grid. So some states in India have these policies and programs where they offer farmers money to sell electricity to the grid. And that provides a powerful incentive for the farmer to decide how to use efficiently groundwater, reduce groundwater use, and make up of some of the losses in income possibly from selling electricity. And these are also fantastic for years of you know drought years where growing crops may not be at all economical and we are working also in Nepal, Bangladesh and Pakistan and all these countries are piloting projects where they are trying to um, trying to um, do, like connect their solar farms to the grid and providing these opportunities for farmers to become energy producers and also incentivize them to use groundwater more efficiently. So I will stop at that and Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Aditi. We very much appreciate your reminding us of the role of groundwater in the context of climate resilience. Well, all good things come to an end and I'm obliged to wrap up this session. In fact, as it is the last of the three sessions for this series seminar on valuing groundwater, I am going to try to trace the arc of all three. We started last Thursday morning with our online session, Ear to the Ground, Community-Based Approaches to Groundwater Management. And Viviana Ray led, that was the last session. Uh, Viviana Ray led the first session with a powerful talk about integrating hydrogeological assessments with the tools of social scientists. And this was followed by uh, presenter Priya from Agayam with a discussion on how groundwater dependent communities in India, while best placed to make decisions, lack data, and how Agayam are scaling community led groundwater management. And then we heard about the 40 million people in Ind Indonesia who are self supplying through dug wells and boreholes installed on private premises that are self financed, unregulated, and unmonitored and also about the local knowledge of groundwater conditions in the deccan basalts that tend to be overlooked by government approaches. And the main thread from uh, all the presenters at this session was the need to work with communities to demystify science, deploy local knowledge to understand what's going on, and to involve communities in the data collection process so that information is understood, trusted, and retained for other users. And then we had our two sessions today, and earlier this morning, the second of our valuing groundwater sessions looked at innovative groundwater management from ground to the sky. And we had, had a, uh, an overview of innovations from, uh, from Seifu Kebede from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and then Veena from Atri um, highlighted potential solutions to overextraction in India, um, showing us a very nice image of a carrot and a stick, um, which made a big impression on me. Um, and the, 
The Lightning Talks uh, covered a range of innovations um, to cover uh, cover a, a lot of problems with uh, arsenic and salinity in Bangladesh, or um, or uh, calculating a, a water balance through through Open ET, and and the importance of having an online platform to visualize uh, visualize um, data. Um, so. Um, so then we got to here. In fact, uh, earlier this morning we also had a presentation on managed aqua recharge from Sharon Megdal. So your your continuation, Dr. Yang Zhang, was a very uh, very um, a great a good continuation of earlier. So, but the overall theme of that session was to highlight the variety of new techniques and old to help us understand groundwater and essential adaptation to local contexts such as low-income countries. So, you've all been here today. I'm not going to go through this final uh, session, uh, except to observe um, that uh, about Rob's sort of sober reflection that without monitoring, we're just guessing. Without accountability, we're gambling and social outcomes can be gained. And we had the counterpoint of the potential of MAR and the value of, of community in delivering effectively on groundwater management. And two of our presenters referred to the importance of groundwater dependent ecosystems. Surprisingly, without referring to that critical groundwater e the dependent ecosystem known as a hydrogeologist. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you uh, to all of our speakers for this session. Thank you so much for your contribution. Please all start writing your abstracts and presenting your ideas for World Water Week 2023. So we again have a strong rep representation from the groundwater family. Let's keep the, keep the struggle going. <laughs> <laughs>